Knowledge is power. And this is Powerful Stuff. Wellness Education Cannabis Advocates of Nevada present the Weekend 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour with the Weekend Radio Team. For the next 60 minutes, we'll take an in depth look at the cannabis reform revolution sweeping the nation. The phone lines are open at 731 1230. That's 731 1230 or toll free. Toll free. 1 866 820 that's 1-866-820-KLAV. Now, let's fire up the news hour. Here is the Weekend Radio Team. Hi, everybody. Happy Tuesday. This is Nevada Cannabis News Hour. Uh, to my right is Kurt Duke Hutch, Perry Haichu. We have Lawrence on the board. He always makes me sound good. Beach is our producer. And I'm Jennifer Solis. Today in uh, the studio, we have a guest named Duval Dorsey. Duval Dorsey is the 420 runner. What is what is what do you do with the 420 running? Well, I am a ultra marathoner and a triathlete, and I'm also a patient. So, uh, when those two worlds kind of came together, that's how I came up with the 420 runner. Now, for those of you that don't know. Um, an ultra marathon is anything that's over 26.2 miles. Yes. Uh, 26.2 miles is the length of a marathon. A marathon. Um, and a triathlete is somebody that uh, runs, bikes, and swims. Yes. That's um, brutal. That is brutal. <laughs> and, and so how did you combine the two, um, running and cannabis? You, you said you're a patient. Right. And um, so do you help that it, it find that it helps you to run? Well, yes. Well, one of the things um, when I first started back running, initially mm -hmm. I had the belief that I couldn't run because I used cannabis. I thought because uh, I smoked, I wasn't going to be able to run. And because so, you'd get winded? Yeah, I'd get winded. I'd get tired. And besides, you know, I wouldn't want to do it or whatever. I don't know. Misconceptions that I had. And then when I started uh, running with a friend of mine that smoked and we smoked every day, uh, next thing I know, he was coming in first place in uh, all the races that we were doing. That's when it started to occur to me that, hey, you know what? I can do this. I can do these races. I can do whatever distance I want. And from there, it took off. So uh, how do I put this? Mm -hmm. Did you decide to start calling yourself the 420? I mean, you can call yourself whatever you wanted. You chose to embody this persona. Is it kind of in response to the stigma of people like kind of putting us in that box like oh you know if you're a stoner you can't really be an athlete and you're kind of held back by that is that kind of what why you chose that or yes sir it has a lot to do with that um i feel that you know you, you see a lot of that it's a myth uh, that i think it's a myth that they're saying hey you do this stuff you're going to be lazy you're going to be unmotivated and we you're hear not going to want to do that stuff mm -hmm. so yeah it's almost it's also in response to that yes very, well, I was going to cool. say, uh, that's, uh, I have a foot injury and an ankle injury, and I used to sit in my car and medicate before I went into the gym because I found that it, it, it didn't make me exercise any less. It just it, it helped me because I wouldn't feel the pain as much. Right, and so medicating before a, a training run, that's not uncommon. Medicating before a training ride, that's not uncommon. But I don't ride on the street. I ride on the trails. Right. But swimming on the other hand you got to be very careful in the open water because the waves are coming there's the, the lifeguard required, could be far away it requires a little more concentration yeah, more just concentration. point yourself in one direction yeah so i be careful with that you know the swimming part well i would also imagine that like especially with running and biking a lot of it you know you're you're going in one path um and a lot of you know is in your mind so it would probably help you kind of concentrate and stay within a lot more than you know than wandering off in weird thoughts so. very much so so it's almost like meditation in a way <laughs> very much so yeah that's a good way to look at it i never thought of it like that but now that you mention it yeah it's a lot like that i have a lot of friends that are climbers that are rock climbers and oh, yeah. they tell me the same thing that that rock climbing itself is like a meditation to them and when they do it on cannabis you know they still have all the safety equipment on uh and they still do well but it just kind of it brings the exercise into a more of a meditative type of mode my uh 
guide, I guess you would call him, when we used to do our multi-pitch climbs when I was a rigger in the stagehand union, used to force me to smoke at every pitch. When he used to big, do big multi-pitch climbs, he would force us to stop because he's like, you're so stressed out, you need to just calm down and and do that and kind of get your head straight, and then we would just go forward through the next pitch. And You, know, you would like do you sport said, climbing? Back in the day when I used to climb a lot, yeah, I used to uh, right be on. very, very active in it, but I haven't done it in a couple years, so... Wow, and it, it is a wonderful, wonderful sport, and I think cannabis can be in a, a uh, I don't want to say a performance enhancing drug, but it can be a a welcome additive, let's say, to a already enjoyable environment. You know what I mean? Everything goes better with cannabis, no doubt. Mm -hmm. So, do you, when you find when you start running, um, a, a lot of people that are exercise or, that exercise and that do uh, running and biking. After so long, the endorphins start hitting. So you get an endorphin high that that kind of, you know, is right up there with that high. Do, do you find that that, does that ease you into that endorphin yeah, high? Yeah, it or? eases you into that. They mesh well together, exactly. Because normally when I start running, I might not be having a good time until after mile five. Yeah. So the first five miles, I'm like, oh, I'm ready to go home or why am I doing this? But then as I get yeah. beyond five, that's when I started to feel good and stuff. That's and that's why I originally started um, medicating before I would go in and run is because it would be so hard to get past that first mile for me. And then after that first mile, it was just like I'd start easing into the rhythm of it and, and get going with it. And the endorphins would then kind kind of the up hardest pitch. part of showing up, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> putting those shoes on, man. <laughs> I, yeah. I uh, watched a documentary about Bob Marley a couple years ago and he mentioned he used to love to smoke cannabis before he went out and played soccer he thought that it always made him play a little better and i never found that to be true when i played soccer but he he said you know he was like you know i would lively up myself before i went and played football and i always thought that was very very cool also once again just trying to break the stigma so you not only do use uh, cannabis to help your run and your meditative mood, so to speak, right. but you also help it well, use use it to help with the recovery afterwards. You were telling me. Yes, afterwards. So after you do a long race, like maybe even a half marathon or a marathon, twenty some odd miles, you're really sore and tired. Your muscles ache, and you know you can just sit around your house and recover, basically. Mm -hmm. And so using cannabis has helped me in my personal experience in recovering quicker and feeling stronger and ready to get back out there sooner. Well, we, and earlier we were talking also, and this is an interesting point that, um, the running community, um, has long been tied to like drinking somewhat afterwards, you know, um, the hashers, uh, are a very famous running group that basically they combine running with drinking. Yeah. And, and drinking activities. Um, you, were, you were saying a name of a race was a... Um... Yeah, I, the last race I did was out at Boot Lake Canyon in Boulder City. It's called Blood, Sweat, and Beers. It's a trail run. Okay. And uh, it's put on by Desert Dash. And at the end, I made a video to go with my blog about the race and my time out there. I did 27 miles in the morning, and I did another 13 later that night in a moonlight race. Oh, my word. Yeah, so it was 40, 40 racing miles in, in one day. And so I made a, a video blog about it, and uh, in the blog I was letting the audience know that I had nicknamed the race Bud Sweat and Beers because I was able to go home after the first race and medicate okay. and then come back to the night race, and you have to wear a headlamp, and it's really full concentration then. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because, yeah. All right, so Duval, here is the important question of mm -hmm. the day. Um, what mm. what got you into you know cannabis in general? You know what 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 motivated you to smoke, or is this something you've always kind of done to relax? Or well, well no, one of the things that uh, really motivated me to uh, start using cannabis was I was fighting uh, addictions that I had to tobacco and alcohol, and so um, and those were having a, a toll on my a real toll on my physical health and stuff like that, and also in my social life. Not that I was maybe so drunk all the time but just at that key moment or i forget to go to the meeting at the wrong time i wake up late that morning because in little incidences that could affect the big picture i realize were affecting my life and so you know so you just said you know what i don't need to drink anymore because i need to be on top of my game maybe on my game and and the cannabis has helped you be 
that person. Right, exactly. Yeah, and you also have to, and when you drink, you have to spend time recovering after you drink, just like you yeah. do when you run and that. And with cannabis, you don't have that recovery time. You know, Very cannabis, good point. when the cannabis wears off, you're just like you were before, but actually feeling better, no inflammation and everything else. So there is no recovery time. I actually used cannabis myself to get off of alcohol. I was, I was an alcoholic. I drank way too much. And uh, when I stopped drinking, I did it myself cold turkey. And let me tell you, there there are physical withdrawals from alcohol, heavy, heavy physical withdrawals. And the only thing that got me through that was cannabis. So I never knew him then. But, you know, I can tell that he was a heavy drinker because we would uh, we encounter his friends that knew him then. And they were like, they were like, dude. Yeah, you know, he, you know, I'm glad you're not drinking anymore. You're such a different person, and all this, this other kind of stuff. And yeah, yeah, I was gonna say I occasionally drink. Last September. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it really has been a big help, and uh, it's really changed my life. You know, it allowed me to become this ultra marathoner and triathlete that I had been envisioned myself being. Well, what's your vision for your future? Where do you want to go with this? Like, what's your ultimate? You know, end game and being the 420 runner. Well, one of the initial steps is to find other 420 runners. I envision uh, the Denver 420 runner, the DC 420 runner, the you know Seattle 420 runner, the LA 420 runner, and then all kinds of 420 runners all over. Right now, I'm in front of the camera, but as things start to pick up, I'll go behind the camera and capture the other 420 runners and and help them document their experience and bring about awareness and and stuff like that. So. Uh, one of the things I wanted to do to to help start that and bring some more attention to this is perhaps uh, do a 5K and work with anybody in the community that wants to do something like that. And that sounds like a great thing. Absolutely. If anybody wants to join Duval, um, I guess you're. Are you are you on our meetup? Yeah, I'm on the meetup. Yes. Well, I'll, I'll uh -huh. maybe I'll put a meetup together um, to see who's interested in. In uh, in running with Duval, we might want, we might have to start him off a little bit slower than running, maybe a weed walk or something. <laughs> <laughs> that, that works too. That works too. A weed walk. That that's uh -huh. that's good. Um, now you're there's a very uh, famous triathlon that's here in uh, Las Vegas. It's the Silverman. Yes, the Silverman. The Silverman. That's coming up, isn't it? Yes, in October. October 4th, I believe it is. That's my big goal for this year. I want to do that. And that will be my first half distance triathlon. So it's half of the Ironman. Okay, and an Ironman. Uh, is the Ironman the uh, 140 or is it 70? Yeah, the Silverman is the 70 and okay. the Iron, yeah, the full Ironman would be the 140. So you're at 70 miles. You're, uh, how, how far are you running? Um, it's going to be 13. Well, you start swimming. You do, do a bit over a mile. Uh, you go to the bike, about 56 miles. And after that, you run 13 miles. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So that'll be my first time up until now. I've done sprint distance, which is the shortest. And then uh, I've done the Olympic distance, a couple of those each. And uh, this weekend on the 21st, I'll be doing the uh, a duathlon out at Lake Mead. Right so on. So I'm going to run three miles, bike 25 miles, then run six miles. Wow. Yeah. And do you, do these um, athletes, do they get sponsored by big companies, stuff well, like that? Well, you know, the pros, the big time guys, yeah. you know, they get a lot of stuff like that. Now, on the amateur level, this not is, you know, uh, customary. So normally, no, they wouldn't. However, I want to be one of the first amateurs to break through into this, you know, because there's a whole market of people that come out here like regular people. Mm -hmm. that do these races that aren't really so much competitive. Mm -hmm. And I think that introducing a brand to them would be good. Now, I am competitive in my age group. So when I compete, I could still get like a first place little trophy and stuff like that. But normally, you know, nobody's getting sponsored to do these to do these races. Well, if you don't mind me asking, what's your age group? Uh, I'm 33 years old. What? Yeah. You don't look past Not like 26, 27 years old. Well, you know, I, I didn't I didn't smoke and drink too much, so, <laughs> you know, so. Well, if people do want to sponsor you for the race, man, how would they find you? How do they get in touch with you? Well, that's a very good question. I'm the 420 runner on Facebook. 
Okay. So look for me there. I'm also runner. I'm also a Vegas 420 runner on Twitter and Instagram. Vegas 420 runner on Twitter and Instagram. Right now I'm running a campaign 420 by 420 and that's on Facebook. I'm trying to get 420 likes by April 20th. I'm going to be celebrating with you guys. We that, can help you that with evening. that. Oh, yeah, we can. Well, yeah, we, uh, we posted that he was going to be on the show, and I think you've probably he, jumped 25, 30 Yeah, yeah, I've jumped that, up. So. I jumped up quite a bit since you guys made that post. I really appreciate that. <laughs> no doubt, anything we can do. All right. So um, we we also have a story that kind of ties into it. Um, there is a an article in the Journal of American Medicine that basically states medical marijuana uh, has been uh, tied to a substantial decrease in overdose death rates from heroin and prescription pills. It also helps recover, uh, recovering addicts ease out of their uh, withdrawal symptoms. I've been so curious about this for such a long period of time because, you know, we're getting into the really high level strength. Uh, of oxys? T8, well, oh. with the percentage of THC that we can extract scientifically now, like we can get these waxes and oils to a really significant the high rate to the point to where I think that if we can deliver it in a controlled environment that we might be able to alleviate some of these some of these symptoms uh, from heroin withdrawal like I've never seen it done personally but I mean I've I've, I've actually I've talked to people that have that have done this um but you know what we're going to be back in a couple of minutes with our 420 moment and Oh, no. he's saying that we got two minutes left. You know, <laughs> I jumped it's the gun. Good. Jeez, oh, it's all good. out of the gate too fast. Well, you know, uh, on that on that point, um, even just smoking it helps with that. I did some research, you know, because I I personally know it helped my physical addiction with with alcohol, um, and so I did I did some research afterwards, and I found that even just smoking cannabis itself, without even the high levels, just the standard stuff, it actually. Uh, Cure, uh, takes away the cue impulse, which is the impulse, the, the mental impulse that says, I need this, mm -hmm. and not the physical impulse, which is what a lot of them, that's the first impulse they get before the physical impulse. So a right. lot of them don't even get to the actual physical withdrawal. It's like, it's the mental withdrawal that hits them first. Oh, well, this is such this is such a public health problem that Massachusetts declared a public health emergency last mm -hmm. year over escalating uh, heroin overdoses and painkiller addiction. Heroin overdoses increased by 80 percent between 2010 and 2012 in Boston <sighs> and in Nevada. And the reason is, is that our ease of getting these um, getting these controlled substances Tick Siegerbloom signed a bill last uh, legislative session that makes everybody go back to their doctor every 30 days to get another uh, uh, Oxycontin um, prescription. prescription. There's another Senate bill, Senate Bill 114, right now in legislature that's sponsored by, I think, uh, oh, God, I, I forgot the Republican who's sponsoring it, but it basically says that if you dispense like more than 90% of your prescriptions for hard pain medications, that they're going to take a serious look at these doctors and the patients also. So, you know, people are trying. Yeah, so. yeah. Okay, well, I guess I'm not jumping the gun now. Local news and our 420 moment after the break. Cannabis has been used as a healing medicine for over 5,000 years with no toxic side effects. Is it right for you? The professionals at Dr. Reefer are here to help. Now accepting new patients, make an appointment today at 428-0000. Bring your medical records, or if you don't have them, their staff will work to document your qualifying condition with a 99% approval rate. If you have any of the following conditions, cancer, AIDS, muscle spasm diseases, severe nausea, severe pain, Crohn's disease, glaucoma, or PTSD, call Dr. Reefer today for your free consultation and their money-back guarantee. If you don't qualify, you don't pay. Call 702-428-0000 to get your Nevada medical marijuana card today. Green Spot Hydroponics is a Las Vegas-based distributor of specialty indoor and outdoor gardening supplies. Locally owned and operated with over 3,000 square feet of inventory. Expert and friendly staff to help you with all your growing and hydroponic needs. Our pricing and service will not be beat. We help you grow. 3355 Westlake Mead Boulevard, just behind the Texas station. Mention we can and receive 10% off. Call us at 702-463-6000. That's 702-463-6000. 
Are you going to be in town this 420 weekend? Join Weekend and Las Vegas Normal for the 420 Freedom Festival. We officially celebrate this worldwide cultural event on Sunday, April 19th with a countdown to 420, New Year's Eve style, and a 420 midnight roast. We will crown Miss 420 Las Vegas 2015. Join us all for a fun-filled day of artists, exhibitors, entertainment, patient resources, speakers, and more at the Las Vegas Concert Saloon. Live music by Mokeshaw, The Signals, Lady Rako and the Sin City Prophets, Sensi, Bloodshot Bandits, New Age Tribe, and the Bourbon Brothers. The Las Vegas Concert Saloon is located at 425 Fremont Street in downtown Las Vegas. Tickets are only $20 and available at Dr. Reefer's offices. For sponsorships and booth availability, contact Las Vegas Normal at lasvegasnormal702 at gmail.com or we can at Kurt, K-U-R-T, at wecan702.org. <laughs> oh man all right this today's 420 moment is about keith strope and normal keith strope is an attorney and founder of national organization for the reform of marijuana laws after graduating university of illinois in 1965 he enrolled in georgetown law school and worked in an office for illinois senator everett dickerson uh, he graduated from law school in 1968 and began working for the Federal Consumer Protect, uh, Product Safety Commission. That job put him in contact with a consumer advocate and activist, Ralph Nader, who inspired Strop. No kidding. Yeah, who inspired <laughs> Strop to create a consumer group for cannabis users. So Ralph Nader was influential in creating of normal. I had no idea. Yeah, well, this next part is this next part. I know about it, but you know who else was influential in creating normal? Playboy Foundation. Using $5,000 in seed money from the Playboy Foundation, Strope founded Normal in 1970. He served as the executive director until 1979, during which time 11 states adopted marijuana decriminalization laws. However, his, dicta uh, his directorship was cut short by a serious blunder. Uh, under the administration of President Jimmy Carter, they had favored marijuana reform. However, Peter Bourne, Carter's drug advisor, disagreed with Stroop on the ending of the spring of Me Mexican marijuana fields with herbicide paraquat, the poison paraquat. In retaliation, Stroop acknowledged to a reporter that Bourne had snorted cocaine at Normal's 1977 Christmas party. Bourne was subsequently fired. Stroop eventually lost his job because nobody likes a snitch. Yeah. Snitches get stitches. <laughs> um, Stroop worked as a lobbyist for a family farmers for a few years in Washington, D.C., and he lobbied for artists in Boston, Massachusetts, before being hired as the executive director for the National Association for Criminal Defense Lawyers and the Specialized Bar Association for Criminal Lawyers, also in Washington, D.C., where he worked from 1989 to 1994. In 1994, he was invited to return to Normal's board of directors, and in 1995, when the executive director, Richard Cowan, stepped down, Stroop was rehired as executive director of Normal, where he worked for the next 10 years, serving as a primary spokesman for marijuana smokers in America. In January wow. 2005, he announced that he was stepping aside as executive director, citing his need for a younger crop of activists to tape, take over the organization with a fresh perspective and new ideas. He remains active in Normal, serving as legal counsel and giving college lectures, and he recently published a book on the history of Normal entitled It's Normal to Smoke Pot. There is a uh, little article that he wrote that's really really clever called the loss of innocence just follow the money and it's about it's about the uh, effect of big money on the legalization movement but he really felt that it kind of deserved additional discussion be because he's had such an influence on the on the industry and obviously you know he's been one of the pioneers uh, he says the basic problem that they deal with from state to state is the need to raise significant amounts of money to gather the required number of signatures to qualify a legalization proposal for the ballot it's the same thing we dealt with here in Nevada which is what IP1 is all about and then they have to also run a professional campaign on top of that and at one time, those states that that provide voters the opportunity to bypass the state legislature and enact new laws by a vote of the people intended this 
to be uh, something ordinary citizens could accomplish with a dedicated team of volunteers, which is how it used to be done. It was an outgrowth of the progressive movement, but unfortunately, those days are long gone. State legislators who un understandably dislike the voter initiative process and prefer to maintain their control over the process of adopting new laws have significantly raised the bar over and over again for qualifying an initiative for the ballot, requiring more and more, signat more, and more signatures, and sometimes requiring that in a minimum percentage of those signatures be gathered from voters in every county of the state, similar to the system we have here, making it nearly impossible to qualify by simply focusing on the major population centers. The result is, a vote that, is that voter initiatives have become unrealistic as a vehicle to change public policy unless the sponsoring group has the ability to raise a lot of money. Political commitment and hard work are no longer sufficient. In California, we ha they had a big handful of uh, small donors supporting legalization initiatives going all the way back to the successful Prop 215 campaign in California in 1996 and continuing through the two successful legalization initiatives approved in 2014. But those funders were motivated by their desire to end marijuana prohibition and were not attempting to directly profit from the changes. They're motivated, they're motivated was high-minded and the need to earn the support of the philanthropic uh, funders tended to assure that the language contained in the initiatives was similarly high-minded seeking to establish legalization systems that were open to all entrepreneurs both big and small until now none of these successful initiatives has has have attempted to establish quote cash cows to, to uh, benefit the funders. We have seen hmm. some ill-advised regulations adopted by implementing state agencies in a few states that clearly favored those with big bucks. Man, ain't it the truth. Like he says, the innocence is gone out of the industry. It's been gone for a period of time. And, that's and didn't why they pay like $3 per signature on this on this IP1 situation here it, at the well, end? Well, I'm not sure how bad it really got, but I know that it got pretty serious toward the end and there was campaign you know, debt toward the end of that, and there was uh, issues with that. You saw that in the uh, what do you call it? In the uh, in the Ralston Live oh, yeah. taping. Yeah. But anyway, I digress. There are other local stories to get to. Well, so. No, actually, and that is that is one of our well. After Kurt's announcement, yeah, well, we need, we do need to talk about IP one. Okay. Yeah. Well, you know, for those of you who don't know, we do have a Las Vegas normal chapter out here. It was actually started by some longtime members, like original members of We Can. Um, and now they're also running normal and we are actually working with them to throw our 420 festival which is happening on April 19th Sunday it's a uh, countdown New Year style and uh, actually we're gonna give away a pair of tickets to the first caller on that at 702-731-1230 and all of you for all of you stoners who are just now putting down your bongs again that's 702 731 1230. <laughs> That's right. Our first caller will get a pair of tickets to that. That's at the Las Vegas Country Saloon yeah. upstairs from Hennessy's. All right. Oh, speaking of IP1 and voter initiatives and ballot initiatives, um, legislative le leaders are indicating that two initiative petitions seeking to extend firearm purchase and background checks and legalization of recreational marijuana are going to the ballot. Yeah, there was a, th see, that kind of ties in with what we were just talking about. That's so strange because uh, this article was just saying about how these state lawmakers love to have control of the lawmaking process. And here we are, these lawmakers have a chance to seize control of it either way and they choose to- uh, Let it pass. Uh, yeah, they choose to uh, allow governing by initiative rather than governing by, by uh, by election, you know, by electing these representatives to represent ourselves. And honestly, I'm fine with it. I like it to go to the ballot once in a while. I don't think we need them to make our decisions on everything, you know, so. Well, you know. I mean, the, the problem with that is when you go out and you uh, collect sig signatures for a ballot initiative, the ballot initiative is the language is supposed to stay in that initiative that you signed, not get massaged by constitutional lawyers oh, with absolutely. wiggle room for people like the big alcohol industry. And that's what happened in IP1 that I'm really protesting because everybody that signed this was not told, oh yeah, by the way, at the end of this, we're just gonna come around and screw you, all the people that have, the big alcohol industry um, is now, had, that has been fighting you guys in Washington and fighting you guys at legislature on the state level against people that that are you know trying to legalize and get dispensaries here and everything else. Instead of fighting us now, they're trying to steal the money. And that's where I am really, well, really, really, really. Now well, you said you had you had an epiphany on this. Well, one. I was just gonna say I don't like this isn't a fact or anything, but this is my 
opinion of what could have happened and why this may may have happened uh and this may be maybe the story that's not really being told um when you have campaign debt you know that's a very serious issue that has to be addressed you can't just not pay these people you have so you have to pay all those people for the signatures you have to pay the people you have to pay what you promised them straight up yeah and uh there were big donors who had lined up to pay money and you know their funds had been tapped out and they have to settle this debt how do they do that what are they going to do well they reach out to these various groups and uh i believe you mean the mme holders well i believe that they were the first group of people that were reached out to and they said look we need this to happen because if you when this law passes it's going to directly benefit you the pre-existing medical marijuana establishment license holders i mean obviously when it goes recreational those are the people who are going to win and so they would obviously be the people to go through go to to settle this campaign debt well they told them to kick rocks in my opinion oh um you know uh we don't have any money we're too busy lobbying or we're too busy spending money on the lawyers or busy acquiring these licenses or building our building or doing whatever they're doing they're spending money elsewhere and we don't have any time for this so uh what's a person to do when there's no money coming from the people who you're fighting to protect well i mean do you know anybody that these people went to and said hey we need some money i don't you know i don't know i'm gonna ask all the mme owners that i that i know yeah go ahead and hey did this guy come to you did this guy come to you and ask you for money or did he go straight to the freaking i was asked alcohol i was asked for money I didn't understand the severity of the situation. And even if I would have been told, I probably wouldn't have believed them anyway. But it's just one of those things like um, it is what it is and we have to deal with it now. So, you know, if, if people are really like angry about it, maybe they should kind of like, the I'm business not... owners might want to look in the mirror a little bit before they start casting the stones at these people. Well, A, I'm not a business owner. I just I just take exception to big alcohol I still trying, don't to, like it. trying to step in and profit where they have held the fence against us oh, for yeah. so long oh absolutely i'm not for ip1 i don't really like it but i i just kind of uh, understand how it may have came about it does kind of make me shake my head a little bit but it's just like man like just here we are you know all so. right so those two um petitions passed through assembly without recommendation um and republican leaders of the assembly decided not to hold a vote on the measures before the deadline and so they are going on the ballot uh the only mm-hmm. way that you can circumvent this from happening uh is is to to put a competing uh ballot initiative mm-hmm. up or competing bill up i suppose if the legislature wants to vote on it and allow the language on the ballot i'm not exactly sure how that would work at this point because we're so deep into the legislative session now would it be an additional question like if it okay this is the first question do you want legalization of marijuana yes or no the second question do you want a third or a fifth um type of license a distributor license but yes or no i don't think that's how it is i believe it's just one question it's one question do you want the legalization of marijuana and then contained within that is and then this is what happens this is what happens because like they said you know it's an 18 month clause if you don't like your distributor after 18 months you can be your own distributor in theory in theory that's how the you know the system is supposed to work um and it's just one of those things so yeah, well, well, we'll see how this works out. <laughs> we have a winner, and right Stephanie is the winner. Stephanie, congratulations. Hi, thank you. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you so much for tuning in. You're going to be going to the 420 Freedom Fest. Woohoo! Thank you so much. <laughs> All right, um, we just need to get your um, we need to get months. your personal information uh, off the air, and we will be sending you tickets. Awesome! Thank you so much. Thank All right, you. thank you. See you there. See you there. I have some uh, some news on Nevada legislature. Also, there's a there's also a bill up there right now that would allow industrial farming of marijuana plants. Uh, Yay! Tick Seeger Bloom is not the primary marijuana. Yeah. Okay. Industrial farming of marijuana plants. I think that's wrong. Well, well no, right. no, no, no. Okay, no. Let, well, this let's is SB three hundred five. You're thinking of a different bill there. Okay. SB three hundred five was introduced Monday. Oh, okay. Yesterday on the floor of the Senate, the bill would allow agricultural research. Uh, colleges and registered growers to purchase uh, to purchase store and buy industrial cannabis and it sets up regulations covering the industry growers would be required to register with the state and meet certain agricultural requirements regarding THC content Mm -hmm. Seeger Bloom said that the intent of the bill was to keep the hemp industry separate 
from recreational or medical marijuana industries in the state. The 2014 federal farm bill included provisions allowing states to grow and regulate industrial hemp. Industrial cannabis products include things like hemp oil or hemp yarn. See, I told you it was hemp. It wasn't, it wasn't marijuana. Well, there is another bill that Tick Seeger Bloom has signed on for, SB 372. It calls for state officials, officials to issue medical marijuana cards for animals. If the animal's owner is a Nevada resident and the veterinarian certifies that the animal has an illness that might be alleviated by marijuana. I guess I got to get one of those for snoozy, huh? Well, hold on. You know, this. Uh, I read this online earlier, and I'm like, how ridiculous. You know, what, what, what a stupid thing. But then I'm thinking to myself, this is actually very, very clever because we've been barking for a long time about patients' right to grow. Yeah, yeah exactly. About uh, patients' right to grow and things like that. And really, if you have a dog, mm -hmm. do you get the right to grow 12 plants for your dog? So if you have four dogs, do you now have the ability to grow 60 plants as a patient yourself and have four dogs with four medical marijuana cards? This is a question. This could be a very clever circumvent to these very minimal uh, plant restrictions that have been imposed on, on patients. I mean, I don't know if that's the intent of the bill or not. Maybe we're just actually looking out for our dogs. But either way, I think it's very clever. There are a couple... Of there are a couple holistic veterinarians in town, and I'd like to talk to them. I think Nancy Brandt is a holistic vet. I, I don't know if she has anything to do with cannabis. So I'll, mm -hmm. I'll give her a call, and maybe we can get her on the show to talk about sure. this. Um, but, you know, and that's another thing. Would you grow 12 plants for a chihuahua? If not, I'm getting some great dangs. Uh, I have a husky, so. <laughs> <laughs> what but, about your rabbits? <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> oh, man. I, uh, I have another story out of Las Vegas here, and this is actually something I'd like to spend a minute on. Oh, um, uh, sure. I didn't really... I, um, it's something that's kind of been overlooked. It's very clever. And the title of the article is uh, Pot Power, a Pricey Concern for Vegas Medical Marijuana Industry. And it goes into saying that early last year, uh, the broker for a 100,000 square foot warehouse near Las Vegas called the power company to find out how much juice the building would need, which is a logical thing to ask. So a longtime Nevada Energy executive, Arnold Lopez, went out to the group on site and asked what kind of business they were planning. They told him they were planning on growing a medical, uh, having a medical marijuana cultivation facility inside. He started asking questions and doing some quick math, and he estimated that this single marijuana growing operation could require five megawatts of capacity. That's enough to power about a thousand average Southern Nevada homes, wow. which, is, which is equal to about 5% of the capacity of an entire substation. That is a serious amount of power to draw out of a pre-existing grid. Yeah. Uh, as, and as Nevada's medical marijuana industry gets off the ground, it's confronting a problem that has gotten little attention. Growing the plants indoors takes massive amounts of power, especially during our summer months when extra cooling is needed. Power, water. And also water. the water, yes. People in the industry have talked about these challenges and possible solutions Tuesday morning at a forum sponsored by the United States Green Building Council's Nevada chapter. The uh, Mr. Lopez from Nevada Power told a crowd of several dozen that marijuana cultivation facilities might use more power per square foot than anything else ever built in southern Nevada. That will require substation upgrades that could strain the power distribution system depending on where and when growers open. This industry really needs a lot of help as far as sustainability, says moderator John Laub, president of the Las Vegas Medical Marijuana Association, who we are also familiar with. Uh, people in the industry are starting to talk about ways to control energy use, he said, but have been more focused on getting the doors open, obviously. Mm -hmm. Nevada has plenty of sunshine, but growers can't use greenhouses for marijuana for security reasons. State regulators bar plants from being visible from outside a cultivation facility. Now, now, you know, we have we have gone back and forth on this one, and I still maintain that you can use greenhouses. You're going to have to have a 12-foot block wall around your property, and you could dig four feet down into into just, the earth and then use the smaller greenhouses that have the low profile that would save on air conditioning because when you go six feet down in, into the ground you have a temperature uh, a drop of about 15 to 20 oh, degrees yeah. well do, uh, our guest a couple of weeks ago from Women Grow, Lori, Lori. Glauser, Lori. a sustainability consultant to marijuana growers, explained what she sees as the absurd results of that rule. As the hot Nevada sun beats down in the summer, growers will have to block out that natural light and then feed marijuana plants with artificial light, which consume energy. It just doesn't make sense. We were uh, we were at a cultivation facility yesterday, and uh, they had uh, the new LED hoods 
and it, they look just like your standard hoods. But I was like looking at them, and they're sitting there, and I didn't see underneath them. And I'm like, where's the venting on these hoods? How, they they're going to run them. hot. <laughs> yeah, no heat. And man, I'll tell you, those hoods were beautiful. No heat coming off them. No secondary air conditioning. No fans to to to, to blow through to cool. How the much balls. power compared to a regular ballast? Uh, it, there, there is no ballast. There's no ballast. No you just ballast. Plug it, into the wall. No plug it right ballast. in. Yeah, you don't even need. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm? Wow. And it's the equivalent. The ones that we saw were the equivalent to 600 watt uh, hoods, and they have equivalent to a thousand watt hoods. And there are no ballasts on them. Well, what this is gonna, I think, what this is gonna evolve into is people are gonna require LED lighting eventually because of the absurd amount of power. Or people are gonna start looking for solar alternatives, or like who knows what this could evolve into. So. Well, you know, hopefully it, it evolves into, into you know, being smart about our cannabis growth instead of, you know, wasting all the water and power <laughs> on, on growing pot. Huh? All right. Okay. What well, else have we I got, got? I got one more news out of, out of Nevada here about uh, Heller. Dean Heller? Dean Heller Senator, is co-sponsoring Senator. Yep, Republican co-sponsoring Senator the medical Dean marijuana Heller. legislation. Um, last week, Wednesday, Senator Dean Heller of Carson City announced he's co-sponsoring the Compassionate Access Research Expansion and Respect States, or Careers Act, S-383, to ensure states like Nevada have the right to determine their own medical marijuana laws. Good. So this, this is, is a- what Republicans are supposed to pretend to be about, you know, exactly. small government and mm-hmm. keeping people out of our business and things like that. And honestly, if you guys are listening to this, I challenge you to send a thank you to Senator Heller and challenge him to come on a radio show if he's such a big supporter of medical marijuana in Nevada. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, he says the time has come for the federal government to stop impeding the doctor to patient relationship in states that have decided their own medical marijuana policies. Mm -hmm. The bipartisan legislation puts Americans who are suffering first by allowing Nevada's medical marijuana patients, providers, and businesses that are in compliance with state law to no longer be in violation of federal law and vulnerable to federal prosecution. Love it. All right. Um, We have to take our second break of the day. After the second break, we'll talk about more regional news and some fun stuff. The Von Dank Group offers turnkey solutions for all your cannabis needs, bringing transparency and responsibility to a young budding industry. Helping patients by producing the cleanest, safest, and most potent medicines and infusibles possible. The Von Dank Group is a design, management, and consulting corporation with over 30 years of industry experience and knowledge of the dispensary, edibles, infusible kitchen, and large-scale cultivation of cannabis manufacturing facilities. Let the Von Dank Group help you grow your cannabis business from seed to green. www.vondank.com Finally, Nevada medical marijuana dispensaries are opening, but you must have your medical marijuana card to get inside. Call the friendly team at Karma Holistic Health Foundation, toll free, 855-420-1110, or visit GetMedicalMarijuanaNow.com. Karma Holistic Health Foundation will give you legal access to medical marijuana. All veterans receive a discount, 855-420-1110, or visit GetMedicalMarijuanaNow.com. Are you going to be in town this 420 weekend? Join Weekend and Las Vegas Normal for the 420 Freedom Festival. We officially celebrate this worldwide cultural event on Sunday, April 19th with a countdown to 420, New Year's Eve style, and a 420 midnight roast. We will crown Miss 420 Las Vegas 2015. Join us all for a fun-filled day of artists, exhibitors, entertainment, patient resources, speakers, and more at the Las Vegas Concert Saloon. Live music by Mokeshaw, The Signals, Lady Rako and the Sin City Prophets, Sensi, Bloodshot Bandits, New Age Tribe, and the Bourbon Brothers. The Las Vegas Concert Saloon is located at 425 Fremont Street in downtown Las Vegas. Tickets are only $20 and available at Dr. Reefer's offices. For sponsorships and booth availability, contact Las Vegas Normal at lasvegasnormal702 at gmail.com or we can at Kurt, K-U-R-T, at wecan702.org. Oh, welcome back, everybody. This is Nevada's Cannabis News Hour. I'm Jennifer Solis. I have Kurt Dukach, Perry Haichu, Beach in the house. We also have Lawrence on the board. And Duval Dorsey, the 420 runner, is still here. Woohoo! Yeah, buddy. Yeah, buddy. Yes, speaking of running, I got some fun news out of Arizona. <laughs> 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 about uh the car chase is a lot more fun when with drug dealers throwing pounds of weed out of the car windows 
<laughs> really? Yes. A, a high-speed car chase was captured from a police cruiser dash cam footage last weekend in Arizona, and it features some drug mules tossing pounds of weed out the window in an effort to thwart the cops. Mario Kart, 64, this is not, but you have to admit there are some serious similarities here. It was a chaotic scene on Interstate 8 near Costa Grande Wednesday as police chased a white truck from which authorities said two occupants started tossing bales of marijuana. Much of that evidence was lost, however. Imagine mm, that. Really? As motorists who followed behind the chase stopped to pick up the drugs. So I wonder how they're going to charge them with, uh, with possession. With possession. I mean, they have the video surveillance, but not, not any of the evidence. They'll never charge them with the weight. They'll just charge them with intent to distribute. Well, you know, they, they kind of already rolled over. During the interviews, yeah. the men indicated that they were offered $1,000 by a female in Phoenix to drive the Trailblazer to I-8 to pick up unknown packages. So. <laughs> Man. <laughs> Jeez, that would have oh, been oh nice to be following them, huh? Yeah. yeah. yeah somebody got lucky. Fun day on Lots the freeway. Lots <laughs> All right, you guys, we have a lot of stuff that's happening during the week. And if you guys didn't take our first cannabis cooking course, that was so much fun. It was a full house. Um, we have the video up on our Weekend 702 Facebook. We, I think we also have it on our meetup page. Um, but we cooked, um, what is it, coconut well, oil? We did basic oils and butters. This time we showed people how to make their own can of butter and their, can, their own can of coconut oil and can of olive oil. And then we used the olive oil to make a caprese salad and mixed uh, some of the olive oil with balsamic vinegar and some French bread and some cracked pepper. And, and that was very nice. Yeah. It was really nice and it was a very fun class. We're going to be having them two, every two weeks and they are filling up fast. Nice. Believe it or not, our next class is almost full. So um, go on to our Weekend 702 meetup page and sign up for the class. And if not, another one coming around in two weeks. All right. Um, this Saturday, March 21st at 11 a.m., we have a picnic with Normal. Uh, Normal is hosting this picnic. We're just going along for the ride on this one. They also have a 420 uh, disc golf uh, competition going on. Okay. And Four it starts at 11 a.m. Yeah. Four twenty. <laughs> it starts at eleven a.m. It's at Sunset Park, but please be advised, people, that there is no open smoking in Sunset Park, and they ask that you leave your medibles. Um, either in your own purse or own possession, but don't bring them to the potluck. It is not that type of potluck. Yes, this is a family friendly event at the park. All ages are going to be kids there and all sorts of stuff. Uh, we do have our We Can potluck the very next day on Sunday at our, at our garden house. Um, that is a patient support potluck on private property. So from 1 p.m. to 6 p.m., please join us at 6490 West Desert Inn. Uh, we do have a, a DJ there with music. Um, we will have our raffles. And I think that we're going to be raffling a magic butter machine this time. No, not a magic butter machine. We're going what to raffle it? off that, that really nice pulse oil piece, the one oh. with the oil collector on it and everything. Oh. It's got a retail value of $279. That's going to be our oh grand my. prize. That's and that's a pretty good grand prize. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. And then lots of other stuff on top of that. Yeah, lots of other swag. Um, let's see. We do have Media Matters with Beach on Monday by appointment and Thursday walk-ins from noon to 6 p.m. at our weekend corporate office at 1771 East Flamingo Suite 201A. And um, we do have our volunteer and executive volunteer weekly meeting on Thursday between 6.30 and 8.30 p.m. at our corporate office. So come in and work. If you want to volunteer, um, you need to take a volunteer, um, you know, tutorial first and uh, on this Thursday. And then you can um, volunteer for any of our events. Also, if you want to get on our, our mailing list and get uh, our newsletter and an invitation to all these events you can simply text we can to 22828 and that'll sign you right up for our mailing list for sure and if you want a booth at our 420 freedom festival on april 19th get a hold of kurt at kurt k-u-r-t those are actually can. going pretty fast aren't they we're almost out of booths already yeah so a lot, yeah. Of, a lot of uh 
anticipation on that. If you're thinking about it, you should definitely get a hold of us very, like very soon. Post haste. Like, yeah. Yes. So they're <laughs> filling up fast. So. So you guys got to remember that uh, the city of Las Vegas, when they were uh, approving our permits for this event, they basically said, "We love we can. We love working with these people. That they're great." Um, we've long dealt with the city and been friends with the city of Las Vegas. All right, uh, let's see. So we'd like to thank this week's special guests, the 420 runner, Duval Dorsey, and Beach's niece, Danielle Baker, for joining us during this live broadcast. Hey. And Danielle didn't say much. <laughs> <laughs> Got a couple of regional stories, don't we, before we sign off? Well, yeah, yeah let's about talk about some regional minutes. stories. I've got a couple of stories out of Alaska real quick. Um, always always news out of Alaska, it seems, since they legalized the uh, recreational ballot, cannabis ballot initiative back in November. It's just been been crazy, as you can all imagine. Uh, let's see. Here's a story that the Marijuana Policy Project is continuing to support the Alaska Marijuana Campaign because it's getting a little bit of friction in legislature. And uh, they're not really turning their back on Alaska. They're kind of continuing to push forward. They've uh, retained the uh, local... What would I call those people? The uh, marketing firm that they were using during the campaign. They're keeping them on. You know, the fight isn't over. There's uh, Senate Bill 30 that came out. It kind of ties into my next story here. Senate Bill 30 is uh, a seriously bad bill that's going through the Alaska legislature right now, which deals with me medical or excuse me, marijuana criminal statutes. Uh -oh. uh, the, the bill has morphed numerous times since being introduced in the Senate uh, Judiciary Committee. The most recent version maintains marijuana as a controlled substance and allows for felony charges for, su for some marijuana misconduct. The bill was met by vehement public opposition during a hearing on Wednesday. The amendment adopted Friday redefines marijuana as the seeds, leaves, buds, and flowers of the plant. Resins, oils extracted from the plant or any compound manufacturer, salt or derivative mixture or preparation from resin or oil, including hashish or hash oil, would not be considered marijuana under the definition. No! This definition would effectively ban concentrates and hash oil. Senator Pete Kelly, a fair Republican uh, from Fairbanks who offered the amendment, said afterwards he never liked the idea of concentrates being included in the initiative. Under the amendment, the measure would take effect February 24, 2017. Exactly two years after the initiative was going to take effect, the legislature can repeal or make substantial changes to the initiative. Before then, the legislature is barred from making substantial changes. The amendment passed four to three. Um, so basically, you can't, it, like RSO for the people two years that are from really, now, really, really sick. The people that have cancer, that are really you sick. You can't that, use half your plant. You can't use any of your trim for anything at all. But uh, there's a, another story that just came out today, actually, an amendment to this pre-existing story. This is a story from the uh, the news miner out of Fairbanks. Their little... Uh, their little newspaper up there. Hold on, I'm trying to pull it up right now. Okay. Let's see here. Uh, the mar it says, Marijuana bills future unclear with Senator Kelly's controversial amendment dying in committee. So now that they, I think they like, they approved it and then they got such a backlash off of it that they went back and voted on it again and flipped it. Uh, let's see here. After a rough initial outing and complete rewrite, the Alaska legislature's attempt at setting state rules has appeared to ground to a halt once more. Uh, Senate Bill 30 was an ugly bill, after, and after a brief hiatus, the bill was rewritten to better address changes uh, to reflect public opinion. That changed again last week when Senator Kelly ad adopted an amendment that would make concentrates and edibles and possibly even the plant itself illegal in 2016 as soon oh as the initiative God. could be altered. Uh, let's see. And then... Yeah, they said it was dead in the water right here, though, because now, after all this public testimony, there are no hearings scheduled and no apparent way to, revolve, to resolve the bill's conflict. So hopefully the bill just dies. But what that'll mean, though, is that the process may be pushed back, as they said here in Nevada. Remember how everything yeah. was supposed to get done so quickly and they decided to push it back and push it back? Well, you know, that seems to be going on in Alaska also. They're just going to push it back as far as they can. You know, they've jacked around for so long that I'm like, I'm not even going to hold another job fair until like it's been two and a half. It's been over two years until things are mm -hmm. open. We were holding job fairs because everybody said, oh, this is going to be up and going and all of this stuff. And I don't want to I don't want to mess people around that are looking for work. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's just crazy. Mm -hmm. All right. So I got a little news out of Washington State. Uh, in January, we all know Washington's first mar uh, passed their laws, and Washington's first ever marijuana vending machine debuted to a mid fanfare in Seattle, and uh, they enacted a bill to get rid of the vending machines, even though it's fully recreational out there. You know, I'm actually fine with that because it'll give real humans jobs. I know that it'll give humans jobs to make the vending machines in a in a plant. 
But then, you know, you're not really interacting with your bud tinder, you right. know. Okay. There's no human interaction. Well, All right. I got a kind of a funny story. They found uh, $10 million of weed found in an avocado package coming across the border. And uh, it was, oh, wait a minute. It was at a shipping center in Illinois. Oh, wow. Okay. So, okay, so no, not- no arrests have been made, though. $10 million of weed. No arrests were made. <laughs> All right, you guys. Um, Special interest killed Utah's medical marijuana bill. We'll have more of that on our Facebook page. And until then, we'll see you next week. You guys be safe out there.